Welcome back to another edition of the 716 Sports Podcast recording here on the week of April 29th, fresh off the 2019 NFL Draft. The Buffalo Bills making moves, making picks. We'll talk about that, everything they've got here as they continue to build their roster for the next season. The Buffalo Bandits wrapped up their regular season. They're getting ready for the playoffs starting here this Saturday, May 4th, and we're going to talk to Bandits player Matt Gilroy about all of that and how they ended their season on the highest of notes on the road at San Diego here this past weekend. Before we do, as always, we appreciate all of you tuning in. If you want to like, share, subscribe to the podcast, you can find it anywhere your favorite podcasts are found. Our homes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, all of the like on Podbean. And you can find us on Facebook at 716 Sports Podcast, on Twitter at 716 Sport Podcast. We're going to get to the NHL playoffs, the NFL draft here in just a little bit, but starting off the show with a playoff bound Buffalo team. It doesn't get old to talk about it. Buffalo Bandits now officially in playoff mode. They wrapped up the regular season on the road. First time on the road at San Diego this past weekend. And Steve, what a. What a way to put the rest of the league on notice going into the playoffs with how well they played on the road on Saturday. It's really back-to-back games where they played pretty complete games against you know two teams maybe that aren't the cream of the crop in the league, especially San Diego without Stotts now. That changes their dynamic, but you know they cleaned up New England pretty well at home. Pretty much just they let them hang around for a little bit and then put them in the rear view. And then San Diego, Buffalo jumps out to a 5-1 lead. Let San Diego crawl back to 5-4 and then absolutely gas them. It was never close after that. I think it was 11-4 to or 12-4 to at some point before San Diego even scored again. Um, a complete, total, solid effort from the Bandits. Um, not just because they won 18-7. to They played a perfect game from the goaltenders, plural, goaltenders, because Higgy played well too. From the goaltenders out, they played a complete game. And it just the fact that Higgy got into play tells you everything you need to know about how comfortably ahead they were in that game that Matt Vin's got to take some time and Higgins got to come in and play well too on top of that. I haven't looked yet, but I know Matt's save percentage was 801, which is bananas to be over 800. And his goals against average was just over 10. Now he played over a half and gave up four goals. So if you factor that in, that's About like eight. It's going to lower his goals against average below that 10 threshold. And I think he stopped like 27 of 32. My point is, I'm wondering where his stats are going to finish or have finished. And obviously, you didn't want him to get hurt. I know Matt Vince is a gamer and does not like to give up his net. He uh, he even alluded that when they were in Rochester, they never even carried a third goalie. It was him and Goodleaf, and that was it. Uh, Buffalo does carry a third goalie, and Vince takes all the practice reps because he wants as much rubber as possible. So there's no doubt in my mind that Vince was going to play that game, but I'm not surprised that they pulled him. And man, Higgy played incredibly well in relief. Um he faced like three or four breakaways and stopped them all. He was unreal. Uh, Higgins played great. Gets the chance to finally come in, so it's good to know if worse comes to worse and anything was to happen to Matt for any period of time. The backup goaltending situation isn't exactly dire. No. So he's very capable back there in handling it himself. And it was the defense, it was the goaltending, and the offense. Sean Evans back into the lineup. He played amazing. Dane Smith having another great game to cap off another huge point total season for him. It's just the team... It, you run out of superlatives at some point to describe how they have progressed throughout this season. That game, once they put the foot back on the gas after letting San Diego crawl back into it, never felt like it was close. Yeah, they're healthy other than Hogarth, and I, I have no official word. I don't think Hogarth is going to miss the playoffs, but I don't have a word on that. But Hogarth slips out because of the injury, and Evans slips back in. And, Jeff, this is why we have some synergy because I was going to go that route. Evans benched. Um, you know, Tavares says after the game, they're just trying to look at combinations. They're a whole team. And Evans did not play that game against New England. Comes back, San Diego. Little fire unders, but we saw it with Corey Small earlier in the year. And, uh, you know, not saying that, that it was a, the right or wrong decision to bench Evans, but it clearly worked because he uh, had a fantastic game in San Diego. Maybe a little bit of a kick in the pants to have to sit that one last home game and come back in and be like, you guys aren't going to want to bench me ever again <laughs> after this. <laughs> and his bad games that he's been having by his standards are only four and five point performances. <laughs> what a bomb. Yeah. And uh, so <laughs> it was interesting to see it like, uh, you know, it, it was maybe surprising even to see him scratched. But that's the beauty of how deep they are as a team that you didn't miss him when you played New England. They did very well without him. And then he was very noticeable against San Diego and played great. So. There was some oomph on that backhand he threw in, too. He was he was proven a <sighs> he point. He smoked it. Yeah, he let that one rip. But uh, 
Yeah, it was a solid win. That's exactly how they wanted to go into the playoffs. I know that there were some concerns from management about playing in San Diego the last game of the year. A lot of fun to be had. The game, quote unquote, doesn't mean anything. And I think there was some worries that they were going to fold up the tents, and they did not. Yeah, they just put the foot foot through the floor on that one. And good for them to have that level of in, like internal motivation to win a game like that when it did not affect. Like They already knew who they were playing. They already knew they were the number one seed when the game was, where it was. It would be easy for a team to fly out to California and just, you know, go out there, go through the motions. But it speaks to how well the coach, how well coached the team is and how well put together they are as a group that they all played that well in that road game for the new team, new building, nothing familiar to any of them completely walked around like they own the place. going to sound like a homer, but what is this team's weakness right now? They there's always room to bitch. Even on a, you know, Patriots fans bitch all the time. Bruins fans are bitching now because they lost one game to Columbus. There's always room to bitch. There's nothing to bitch about this team right now because I'm sure, you know, people don't want to hear me talk them up like that because, you know, they, they they haven't won anything yet by any stretch. But they're, they're, what's their weakness? Their transition is good. They stop transition against. Their defense is solid. The goaltending is elite. Offense is unbelievable. Like, they're one of the most potent power plays in the league. They're the top penalty kill in the league. Like, this is... It feels like the perfect storm. And while everything is lined up like that, we've lived here in Buffalo long enough and seen enough sports to know that once you get to Saturday, Matt Vin's safe percentage goes back to zero. Dane Smith's point total is zero. Face-offs, power play, penalty kill, all of that is zero. And if New England comes out and is a better team for four quarters, we can talk and look back on those 14 wins and none of it's going to matter. Mm-hmm. So it's all going to come down to can they continue to play to this level once it becomes playoff time. And I certainly think that they are very capable of doing so, but we will see how that translates to do or die. You can't make mistakes. You just got to play the game that you're capable of because it's incredible what they've been capable of. Even when they haven't played their best, they've been a very, very, very dangerous team. And they, as much as they don't want to do it, they've won plenty of games playing two quarters and they've won them running away sometimes, but, it's you know it's encouraging to see where this team is and you have to be excited for Saturday. Why don't we plug the game? Saturday, May fourth, yeah. seven thirty p.m. face off. So uh, when this drops Tuesday morning, you'll have four days to grab your tickets. Um, yeah, it's it's gonna it's an incredible building, and I've been a season ticket holder for five or six years now. I think can't believe I drew a blank there. They play New England seven thirty yeah, May fourth. Yeah, get your so playoff rematch tickets. their home finale. I think tickets started like fifteen bucks too, so you can't just, do that. There's not a better, and this is not bias. This is not you know we're a Buffalo sports podcast. This is just me genuinely for what I do in my free time. There's not a more fun sporting event to go to in Buffalo than to go down to a Bandits game. Other teams try to replicate the kind of fun. It's just natural. The team is fun. The atmosphere is fun. It's just great to be too. So if, if if you've never been, no better time to go. If you have been, you know, go find some buddies and go down there. It's the perfect place to be on a Saturday night when it's still kind of cold out. There here. are legitimately playoffs in Buffalo. Get your ass there. And if everything goes well, you'll have a couple more chances to get yourself really involved later on this mm-hmm. month too, as that continues to develop. But we're not going to not going to let ourselves nope. get ahead of the game on Saturday. There's one game on the schedule right now. It is Saturday, May fourth. And New England, while Buffalo did handle them pretty well in that home finale. That was not a runaway game for a lot of it in the first half, and Mike, you spoke to this a lot too. Defense was kind of all over the place. There was a lot of good looks at Vino, and just eventually the defense caught up and the offense put it away, but that game was not out of the question at halftime. They just got back to the locker room, so New England is certainly capable of keeping with the Bandits. We'll see how that goes. Again, faceoff is slated for 7.30 this upcoming Saturday, May 4th. Star Wars day live long and prosper while we have the chance here to continue talking about the bandits we're going to welcome in buffalo bandit matt gilray to talk about his season here look forward to the playoffs and we're joined now by matt joined now on the line by matt gilray bandits defender transition player big guy bandit defenseman matt gilray thanks for coming on the show we appreciate your time no problem thanks for having me so the first question that I have for you, I actually just ran this by Jeff because this is really important to me. Um, how many <laughs> arguments have you won with Mickey by saying they drafted me first? Um, well, up until pretty recently, 
it was a it was a pretty good bargaining chip, but yeah. after rookie of the year, I kind of I'm kind of screwed up. <laughs> I was just thinking, it's like twins. You know how every even twins they're born a couple minutes ahead of each other, yeah. and the one forever has in their back pocket that I'm the older one. And since the bandits did technically draft you first, I don't care what what numbers he has, they chose to pick you before him. So you should win some arguments with that. They did, but they also gave him a trophy. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the team voted on that, right? So you just got to be mad at the team about that. So anyways, uh, a hell of a year, Matt. And, um, you know, you were not a part of this team the last two years, but the the standard that Buffalo Bandit Lacrosse has set is championship or bust. And they finished last the last two years. And although you were not a part of that, that clearly has not been the case this year. I know you'll want to give credit to the team because the team has played incredibly well, but you have been a vital part of that turnaround you guys like you and Mickey and um, a lot of the younger guys, Corey small coming in the defense, especially speaking to your end seems to be able to play the style that the coaching staff has wanted because you guys are young, you're big and you're quick. Talk about the turnaround, what it feels like being a part of this team that just locked up first place in the league. Um, well, honestly, being a part of this team is something really special. Um, it's one of the closer knit teams that I've ever been a part of. Um, Defensively, I think we have guys vet, like very good veteran guys like uh, Pre, of course, and then having picking up uh, Vino in the in the off season, it, he just brings a whole another aspect to the game. He's so good in the net that even if you do screw up or make mistakes on defense, you know it's a good to better chance that he's going to bail you out. So it just takes a lot of pressure off you. Um, everything's been. Like right from right from the get go, right from training camp, they've they made it clear that it's it's a new season, it's uh, like a blank slate. So uh, the stuff that happened in the past happened in the past, and we're moving we're moving forward and um, doing what we could to be the best team on the, that we could put on the floor every weekend. So um, I think Richie and uh, JT have done an incredible job giving us the game plan, and then our veteran leadership kind of spurred us in the right direction and it's, it's paid off thus far, but it's a new season now. So now you, you can tell us the season's gone along, how close knit the team is and how much you guys enjoy playing with each other coming off of the last couple seasons. When you guys started here this year, driving towards where you are now going into the playoffs, was there this feeling already at the beginning of the season that you guys were capable of achieving that top spot in the league where you currently sit? Uh, I think we knew that we had a ton of talent in the locker room. It was just kind of what we do with that talent, right? Um, like I said, we had a, a number of pretty big pickups in the off season with Vino and Smallsy, um, trading or getting uh, picking up Sweets, who's a great guy in the in the backcourt there. And then, um, yeah, every, like right from the get go, it's been like a really close knit team. So uh, I think we knew that we could. It was just a matter of if we could put it put it out on the floor every weekend so the last two weeks you guys play new england at home which we all knew was a most likely a preview of what was coming this saturday and a, a pretty good game they hung on hung around in the first half you guys did a good job putting them away a real strong second half effort especially from the defense and then san diego uh, i know that there were some concerns about a game that quote unquote didn't mean anything you guys are traveling to california san diego kind of needed the game you guys put together eight quarters of really solid lacrosse to wrap up this year. Yeah, I mean, um, we figured that we were going to be seeing New England in the playoffs um, at some point, like no matter kind of where we ended up. Um, so we wanted to make sure we were setting the tone for that. I mean, they're a great team, so it's not one of those things that you can really take lightly. Um, it's, it's This is like, in this league, there's no easy game, so... Um, we're going out there every week and trying to put our best foot on the floor. Um, with with last week, we we had a we had talked to our coaches and our coaches let us know that it, that it didn't matter if it was technically like quote unquote meaningless game. Uh, we go out there and we play for we play bandits across no matter what we no matter what's on the line. So it was just like any other week for us, really. Now. As you mentioned a couple moments ago, all of that's kind of in the rearview mirror. Not that it wasn't all great and enjoyable, but it's a whole new season starting on Saturday. How does your mindset change, or how does the team minds, team's mindset change now as you prepare yourself for a one-and-done game coming up here on Saturday night? Yeah, I mean, it's, 
definitely in the back of your head, you know, like your life's on the line with the one and done. But um, the way that I'm going about it is just like any other week. We've had a great season so far, so I don't see any reason of really uh, changing anything up and thinking too much into it. Um, preparing is one thing, right? But uh, you don't you don't want to think too much and get yourself all worked up. It's just a lacrosse game at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, we're definitely uh, we're definitely for this weekend. We can keep the ball rolling. So you guys get to travel all over North America to some pretty cool sites. I've never been out to the West Coast. Had you ever been out to the West Coast before? How was San Diego? It looked awesome. Um, yeah, it was amazing. Um, obviously, the weather is uh, not something you can be uh, too upset about. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a great trip. Um, we had a good time. Yeah. We got to see a little bit of the city on, on Friday, nothing too crazy, but, uh, it was still a business trip. So it was, but it was a, it was a really fun weekend for everybody. I think. Were you part of the scooter brigade? And it was totally unfair because Chase got to practice on a scooter <laughs> for a couple weeks. I made sure to give him <laughs> shit that he was practicing his scooter life scooter man. so that he was ready for San Diego. I was very much ready for the scooter, and I was a big part of getting the boys on board for that. Oh yeah, you're a big scooter yeah. guy. Me and oh yeah, me and Clutes ripped around those in Denver this summer a bunch. So we kind of we kind of put the thought in everybody's ear, mm. getting on board with uh, the scooters. No, those are motorized. Oh yeah, yeah. They, oh yeah, they, they get going pretty good too. Yeah, get a hundred miles to the gallon on this hog. A little Dumb and Dumber <laughs> reference when they, but yeah. So who had the who had the hardest time on those things? Um, well, uh, Shani actually took a spiller <laughs> in, a, in a pothole and oh. took a tumble. And after that, he was pretty conservative. Yeah. <laughs> and who was the pro? You said you and Klutch had done it in Denver. Who was the pro out there? Um, honestly, everybody, everyone got pretty confident on it. <laughs> Except poor Shani, who... <laughs> you were getting pretty ballsy with it. Yeah. Anybody jumping <laughs> stairs or anything? Um, I mean, Fraze was hopping up and down yeah of course i told you he practiced he was using yeah yeah, he was using scooters on the stairs when we were there a couple weeks ago at the arena so (laughs) anyways he's been there before so matt one last thing before we let you go here as we're trying to you know encourage everyone who's listening might find this to come join us in the crowd for the game on saturday night your first year here at banded land what has it been like playing in front of the buffalo crowd um it's been amazing we have the best fans in the league it's and it's not even close um every game it's such a cool atmosphere to to come out there we have fans that travel everywhere um it's it's unbelievable to have a support group like that and going out there and being able to play in front of a like a fan base that cares and is always there like no matter what it's really it's really awesome and it's not it's not something that is super prominent in our league having a fan base uh, as strong as us and it's it's been it's been unbelievable. All right, no pressure or anything. Don't screw this up. You got to okay. give us your best plug for Saturday. You need to tell us exactly where to get tickets, how to get tickets, why we should get tickets, how to get free tickets from you. No, that's not it. No, <laughs> Don't no, do no, the last no part. not that last part. Give us your best plug, man. Saturday round one of the playoffs against New England. Don't mess this up. Yeah, Saturday round one against New England. Get your tickets. I believe it's um, on the Bandits website. That's correct. Uh, I will verify. Bandits.com is confirmed. Bandits.com. Go and get your tickets and support the boys, and hopefully uh, hopefully we can get the win and move on. Hopefully it is the first of at least three more home games least three. this right. season. Uh, you guys would probably rather it not be. Just finish it up. But let's not jump ahead of ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Start with Can't New England on Saturday. Not at all. Yeah. Matt, thanks for your time. We appreciate it. It was really great chatting with you. See you Saturday at the arena. All right. so thanks for having us. And again, thanks to Matt Gilray for joining us here on the podcast as he gets ready for a big game on Saturday night. And not to to beat it to death, but if you are interested in joining all of us at the game and supporting the boys, joining the party, uh, tickets are available on Bandits.com. They are the best deal in town. Game is this Saturday night, May 4th at 7.30 p.m. against the New England Black Wolves. Now, that was not the only big news of the weekend in Buffalo sports. Of course, from Thursday through Saturday, a lot of eyes were turned towards the networks of ABC and ESPN to see how the Buffalo Bills would fill out their roster in the 2019 NFL draft. And 
early returns, gentlemen, I think are pretty encouraging, at least at the top, the very top. You got a guy in Ed Oliver who I have not seen very many dissenting opinions about. I actually love this draft through and through, man. I'm super excited about it. And you know, the real shocking pick in the draft was the third round pick, the running back, which kind of came out of left field, but he got, I guess he's a really good value pick. And let's talk, let's talk about running back for a second, because I would agree. That was the one that surprised me the most. It sticks out to me. If I look at this draft, you have LaShawn McCoy, you sign Frank Gore, you sign TJ Yeldon, and now you draft Devin Singletary. Do you think the Buffalo Bills carry four running backs into the regular season? And if the answer to that question is no, who do you think is the guy who is jettisoned off this team? Steve is raising his yeah, hand. But I was going to answer your question with a question. Do okay. you think that running back room stays healthy all year? Because that, I think, is why Devin, uh, Devin Singletary Yeah, it was a good pick. I don't know why I just drew a blank on his first name. But I don't think that that running back room stays healthy, and I think that's why they do carry four. Sorry, even, I didn't mean to... Even if they go into game days with three it might be worth putting Singletary on the practice squad or see if he could do special teams just in order to to justify a fourth running back I mean like Steve said it's I I doubt that this especially since Shady's 30 Gore is older than dirt I doubt those two stay healthy the whole season so it's good to have a fourth running back so at worst you have him on the practice squad since he has that eligibility and maybe you free up some room next year with for him to be a top the top back or a top two back. Well, they're going to be that's careful. That's the other about part of it. McCoy too. and Gore are both gone after this year. So when you have McCoy and McCoy's contract up and Gore on a one year deal, then you're going to need somebody in two years. And at this point, you would be left with just Yeldon. So is this a move that if Singletary, even if he doesn't play this year or doesn't play much, you would hope as a third round pick he will. But you know what I mean. Um, I mean, they're going to keep him on the roster, the though. There's, there's no way they're going to be able to stash him on the practice squad where anyone else can sign him as a third-round pick. I, if anyone goes, I think it's going to be Gore or Yeldon. Uh, because I think I think, I think think he brought Gore in for his pass-protecting ability, uh, really. He's one of the best uh, pass-protector running backs in the league. Um, I, don't know, I forgot what I was going to say. No, I got distracted. I'm sorry. My fault. <laughs> um but I don't think they're gonna cut Shady. I think I don't. I don't think Shady gets cut. I don't think Shady. I think Shady's a year last year was not on him. I don't think he's thirty, but he's still Shady. He's quick. He's super quick. Yeah, but now he's, he's out here fast. spoiling Avengers Endgame from everyone who wants him here anymore. Mm. Uh, I didn't I see want, any tweets. Thank I didn't I want see that good either. Football players. Yeah, I don't give a shit about the movie. I never seen a single. It's movie. a low character move. <laughs> this is a character team. McDermott you know saw what? that on his way to the theater, and he immediately drafted Singletary. That's feeling, my fan theory. I, he was feeling very emotional that he had to post that video right away. I don't blame the man. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just going to start posting Game of Thrones spoilers on the podcast. Facebook it's funny. People on follow us. For, it's, for me, I'm, it's funny because I'm not pro running back. I don't want them to spend money on running back. I don't want them to spend draft capital on running back because I just watch like Kareem Hunt gets removed from his position, and then Damian Williams comes in and does just fine. I'm not saying he's as good as Kareem Hunt, but it did not cost the Chiefs. You don't look at the Chiefs and say, you know, that running game really hurt him against New England because it didn't. Like they, it just doesn't bother me. I'd rather see these retreads get brought in as a free agent than a big draft pick. Um, so I might have liked a running back at a later round than the third. But if this guy, you know, they're saying he's a mini shady. They're saying he's, if he's good, and I don't know, I don't feel like they overpaid for him. Maybe I'm just being a homer. But I'm not upset with a third round pick of a running back. I just think it'd be. I think I see a revitalized Shady this year behind this offensive line. They put a lot of, they put a lot of care in this O line this offseason, and I'm really excited to see this team now just with that offensive line alone. Well, running is such it's 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 more of a group play than it is a running back play. Like you look at what David Johnson wasn't able to do in Arizona last year, and their offensive line struggles were very widely promoted and talked about. Running back is only as good. As 90% of the time, a running back is only as good as the lanes he has available. The other 5 to 10% of the time, you know, maybe he makes someone miss and make something out of it. But if he doesn't get that initial burst, that initial chance to get through the, the first line of defense, every running back is going to struggle if they don't have the right players, blockers, offensive linemen, or scheme in front of them. They talked about how Shady might have been running scared, that even if he had a lane, he might have missed it because it was never there. Like, he had to run the ball differently because of how often he was blown up in the backfield that definitely could have changed his approach. It's and, it's like a quarterback. You talk about a quarterback's internal clock when he keeps getting hit, it keeps speeding up. The, the same thing has to apply to Shady or any running back like that. You assume that you have to just turn it upfield immediately and just try to get something out of it because you think that if you're patient, you're just going to get buried alive. 
for a guy who lives east to west like LaShawn McCoy does, it had to be so frustrating to not be able to take his time and pick his spot. Uh, but if, uh, to your original question, if anybody goes, I think it's Yeldon or Gore. I think it's easy. They're not going to get rid of their own draft pick that early. I think those two guys have a lot of work to make the roster. They could save a lot of money if they cut Shady, right? Don't not, not a ton. They also no. have a lot of cap space still, so yeah. what's the point? Like, Is yeah. that cap space going to be for Ziggy Ansa? If they, no, it's, yeah, if they need that cap space, I'll, I'll cut Shady. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that. So apparently, the, I'm not trying to pull us away from the draft. The Bills in New Orleans are waiting to see how he clears medically after this procedure he had. He had like a knee procedure or something, Ziggy Ansa. And once he's cleared of that surgery, then the Bills and Saints are supposedly in on signing him. I don't hate it. I mean, you could always use more good pass rushers mm-hmm. like that. Of course, the health is a huge question because you don't want someone who's only going to be available X percent of the time. I think Hughes is going to have a big year. 31 years old, contract year. I think Hughes is going to have a really big year, but that's just me. Well, now, too, you've got, to swing back to what you were just talking about, you got that Oliver mm-hmm. coming in, a guy who's going to eat up blockers on the inside, and you can't leave him one-on-one with a guard because he's just going to eat him alive. Him against next to Star, who's going to eat up blockers, and then... It could be a great year to be an edge rusher on the Bills because you're going to be seeing a lot less double teams, at least with the front five, than you have been for the last couple of years. Even with Kyle here, it was Kyle and you know, whoever else next to him, really. And this dude wanted to come here. Mm-hmm. He, he did. did. There's, yeah. a, there's a video on Facebook I saw of him just raving about the Bills facilities before he even got drafted. But uh, Corey, speak, Corey Ford, too. Same thing. If we're, if we're going to talk about it at Oliver, we got to talk about how we got him. Yeah. Cheers to the Raiders. <laughs> L. Davis still lives. <laughs> <laughs> if L. Davis was still alive, they would have taken D.K. Metcalf. <laughs> yeah, probably. The spirit of him lives on in the... so. And the Giants up there drafting a basketball team, taking the Duke guy. And <laughs> <laughs> so the rumors that came out during the day from Rappaport were that the Bills were looking to trade up to number three. Now, it wasn't told who they were looking for, but apparently the contingency plan was if uh, Quinn and Williams went number one to Arizona that they thought that the Jets were likely to take Ed Oliver, and they wanted Ed Oliver. So they were going to trade up to three to take Ed Oliver. Now, thankfully for not losing additional future picks and hopefully not future first-round picks, if that to move up six spots to number three, Ed Oliver does fall up number nine. Quinn Williams doesn't go number one. He goes to the Jets. The Raiders take Cleveland Farrell. The Giants take Daniel Jones, a pick that will either be considered to be super genius or incredibly dumb in three years. We'll find out one way or the other. Imagine trading OBJ and then drafting a quarterback number six. Yeah, right. I don't, I just, I Imagine trading so. Khalil Mack and then taking Clellan Farrell. And <laughs> number saying, We're four. set now. We're all good well, yeah, now, no, folks. You know, you know what John Gruden said after they traded Khalil Mack? You know, it's really hard to find good pass rushers in this league. I can't imagine <laughs> why, John. You tell me more even harder when you trade them away yeah i love football guys man they're great that's great i liked how the browns the browns the bears before the draft uh tweeted out a video of khalil mack is like sorry guys we already got our first round pick i hope you like him mm-hmm. solid so oliver goes number one uh pulse of the room on that one feels like we are all pretty much on board for I oliver think, i don't think anybody's upset by it anybody he was a guy who i think was not coached correctly or used correctly in yeah, college at all guard by a coach who Got fired. He went to a program that wasn't a traditional power. Was thought coming into the year to be basically like a one A one B with Bosa, and then didn't do anything because he was banged up a little bit and playing a non a, a technique in a system that wasn't to his strengths essentially at defensive tackle. So he has a chance to come in here on a four three next to Star Latulale and Jerry Hughes and Trent Murphy or whoever's on the other side and just eat guards and centers alive. And I am here for it. I cannot wait. I'm also all here for round two pick Cody Ford, who was projected, I think, to be a top 20 or top 25 talent in this draft, comes to Buffalo at pick 38 in the second round, and JR is all about it, so I'm all about it by default. JR loves it, an Oklahoma boy, a Sooner boy. That boy's a slobber knocker. (laughs) And he really, we, we talked about, I think, a little bit on last Monday's podcast, too, is like the offensive line, a lot of great moves in the offseason already in free agency but maybe they look to get that one blue chip young guy coming in i think that cody ford has the potential to be a building block for that offensive line not just now but moving forward and you know you're a bills fan here it's round two the top of round two the bills are up and there's still a lot of great receivers on the board and you're thinking receiver receiver and most of buffalo probably wanting dk metcalf that guy's fool's gold <laughs> you'll see um 
And then they picked this guy as tackle. But I love this pick. It's not the sexy pick, but it's the right pick. And this is like, when you're building a house, you want a strong foundation. In football, your foundation is, your, is both lines. And they took care of both of those lines in the first two picks. And Cody Ford is a first-round guy. I think he's going to be a great player in his own line for years. They moved up to get him, but they didn't spend a lot. What did they spend? The McCarran pick? They spent 40 and a fifth, correct? And I think the fifth-round pick was the McCarran pick. I believe that was the McCarran pick. So, fact check I, I mean, Tampa Bay, they must have been afraid Tampa was going to take him. I mean, that's what that must have been their thought. Because who did they trade with there? Oakland? Whoever they traded with clearly wasn't going to take him or they wouldn't have made the trade. So they right. must have been afraid that Tampa Bay was going to take him at 39. So they jump up two spots by giving up. I'm not mad that they traded up in this draft because they still picked eight players. It's not like they traded up and lost out I mean, on half bodies. the point of building up draft capital like that and always looking to what stack picks is that you give yourself the flexibility to do something yep. like that. They came into the draft with 10 picks, ended up making eight. But, I mean, giving up a fifth round pick to get a guy who was probably a first round talent. I'll take that any that's time a, of the week. That's a win. That's every time. why you have extra picks. That's why you try to get something, anything for a guy like McCarron when he's on his way out, because that pick, if Cody Ford turns out to be a cornerstone of this offensive line for 10 years, you could say that you traded AJ McCarron, who was going to be a backup quarterback for Cody Ford. You hope is going to be, an all-star on this team. Another guy that wanted to be here. He was interviewed like 10 days before the draft. Loved it. And they said, where do you want to play? And he said Buffalo because he knew the O-line coach. And Yep. So that's their second round pick. They, have, they make two third round picks. We talked about Singletary a little bit out of Florida Atlantic, the running back. So we'll see what role he has, what, whether he gets a chance to play, whether it's because of injury or excellence of his own to, to step in. I think it's always good to have young running backs the running back cliff appears to be a little more significant maybe than even it was previously. And the, the trendy thing to do is you, you get a young guy in on a young deal. You run him for five to six years. You let him go somewhere else and you bring the next guy in from the third or fourth round of the draft. So not a bad idea for Buffalo to have a young guy available like that. Also take tight, take tight end Dawson Knox, one of two tight ends taken in that draft. Interesting to see them go with two tight ends in the draft. Maybe a little bit. It's good to have, weapons for your quarterback but so you sign Tyler Croft you draft two tight ends you have a couple other guys here someone's going to be the odd man out here I mean maybe it's just the seventh round pick is the odd man out but interesting that maybe they're just going with an entirely new group of tight ends here this year well the knock on Dawson Knox is he never caught a touchdown pass right but I mean Croft is kind of a bit of a touchdown guy Croft so if it's one of these things where Dawson Knox plays I mean of course there's Kroom too but that Knox plays three downs and then you get to the red zone and you bring Tyler Croft in. I'm fine with that. My friend Taylor and I were talking today and um, they, she'll be listening. So she'll be excited. What would it have taken for the bills to get Hawkinson? Obviously he got taken before them anyway, but if Oliver and Hawkinson are both there, they're still taking Oliver, right? I think so. So yeah, what probably. would it have taken for them to get Hawkinson? Was that ever, ever even a possibility in the first round? Not if they were intent on taking too, Oliver. It would take too much. The only way they would have, to, I think, the only way they take Hawkinson is if Detroit takes Oliver at eight. But then they don't go to like another defensive lineman or pass rusher. They would totally change gears. I don't know. This is just fun to think about. It's it, it's interesting to think about because it was a. I mean, you drafted a lot of the top offensive linemen fell tackle. out of the draft. Like the guys yeah. who were around there, like Jawan Taylor, Taylor yep. fell out, and um, it's interesting to think that I I don't know. They put themselves in a position where really in the first round at least they could do best player available. And I think that if Hawkinson was available at nine, well, I'll say if Hawkinson and Oliver were both available at nine, it's interesting who would have been the better player overall because tight end and defensive tackle have such entirely different mm -hmm. skill sets. It's hard to compare apples to apples with those two guys. Hawkinson is thought to be a gener another one of those generational tight ends in the Gronkowski vein of athleticism <laughs> in a league that is becoming more and more tight end focused. But Oliver, and we, you talked about it, Justin, Oliver loved it here. He wanted to be here. He wanted to play here. And I think that feeling was very mutual from the Bills organization. You know, a couple of guys at the top of the draft and him and Cody Ford, who not just were talented, but also completely bought into being Buffalo Bills, which is such a hard sell, it feels like. We talk about this with free agency every year. No one wants to play here. Antonio Brown doesn't want to come here. No one wants to be part of this team. You have to convince Mario Williams to live in Orchard Park and give him a huge contract to come here. It's like, it's so hard to get guys to buy in that I think if Hawkinson and Oliver are both on the board, they still take Ed Oliver. If Oliver is gone and Quinn and Williams is gone, 
I don't know. I think Hawkinson is the best pick there, but I I don't know that they make it. It's interesting at nine if Oliver's off the board. I think they trade down. They might have. They would have tra- but I like this pick, Dawson Knox. I think it's really under the radar pick because of his production, which is what everyone's questioning him because he doesn't have a touchdown catch. But the other two guys on this team are DK Metcalf and AJ Brown, who are very good receivers at Ole Miss, and their quarterback stunk <laughs> at Ole Miss. So I think th- this guy is six foot four, two fifty four. This guy's a, a big port- boy. He's a prototype linebacker, and he moves like a receiver. It's a, a receiver. I mean, if you watch the highlights of the catches he's able to make, he's got great hands. He's a good player. I think I think this guy dropped because of his lack of production. But like I said, the guys he was on the fields with. There's a lot of touches going around, and there's a third guy that's good. And he got, uh, I forget his name, but uh, but I like this guy. I like this pick. I think he's going to be a good player um, for the Bills. I don't know anything about his blocking, but I know he's a really good athlete, uh, great hands, and he can move for a six foot four, two fifty dude. So I'm excited to see what he can do. So after Dawson Knox, I go defense here for the vast majority of day three. Linebacker Voshan Joseph out of Florida. Uh, round five, number 147, they go with safety Jaquan Johnson in the sixth round, defensive end Daryl Johnson in their first of two picks in the seventh round, and just three picks later, as we alluded to earlier on, uh, tight end Tommy Sweeney. For those last few picks, guys, anything that really stands out to you other than maybe just a continued focus on building a tough-to-play defense, a deep defense? If you're taking a late-round pick, a late-round DB, give me a guy from Miami. Miami University. This guy's just athletes, dude. I'll take it. Like I saw, like I, I just saw a guy from uh, Miami University, and I was like, I'll take it. These guys are just these guys are built for football. Yeah, and I mean, there's something to be said for those big program players who maybe even if they weren't the most successful college players, they played with a lot of them. They played against a lot of them. I mean, Joseph too. He played linebacker against some of the best offensive talent in the country in the SEC. He's seen. A lot of as, as close to NFL game speed as you can see in college, I believe, exists in the SEC. He's playing number one draft pick after number one draft pick, uh, no, first round draft pick after first round draft pick in that league. So it'll be interesting to see if those guys can become good, solid rotational guys. I think there's been a lot of guys that have played in the Bills secondary, especially going back to Jaquan Johnson, who have come in and they have been immediate impact players. And it's not just the guys that we've expected either. This regime has done an yeah, excellent job of Matt scouting Milano, defensive backs. Yeah, Matt Milano, or yeah, defensive backs as well. And Milano's so, another good example. EJ Gaines. Obviously the, obviously, the marquee picks this draft are the first are the first two picks, Ed Oliver and Cody Ford. But I feel like the next two players, everyone is excited. Oh, I can't talk. Everybody is excited about is Tappy Jackson and David Sills. I'm about to say you can't talk about the draft without talking about what they did. As soon as the draft ended, and it was really basically as soon as the draft ended, late Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening. I mean, it was literally announced right at the end of the draft show. There was a handshake agreement in place you had to feel. I'm actually not really surprised that he didn't get drafted, Tyree Jackson. I'm a little surprised. I mean, he's he's got a strong arm. He's not super accurate. Sounds kind of like Josh Allen. But you watch him play, he's like a baby deer. He's still growing into a 6'7 frame. He's, He's lanky. He's not a super great athlete. He's got a cannon, though, which is kind of why I like to like to pick up. Because if he makes a team and Allen goes down, like you have a guy with the same skill set that's going to go in there. Strong arm, it could run. The reason I'm surprised is maybe a little off of that beaten path for it. He came out early, and it's uncommon to see a guy like that who declares early with rising draft stock who doesn't get drafted. I feel like a lot of agents, people have their finger on the pulse, like, like you'll, be, you'll get drafted third or fifth round. I mean, we were sitting and talking. There was discussions whether or not this guy was going to like sneak into the second round at points during draft analysis. Well, he was number number one on Kuiper and McShay's available players board almost the entirety of day three. I think it is surprising that he was available as an undrafted free agent. One of the things I saw though is that he that um, just based off his physical bill and. Um... His skill set, he's kind of paying for the sins of guys like Osweiler, who are the really big guy and really big guy. And these guys didn't really pan out. And they'd rather take him as an undrafted free agent instead of taking a chance with the draft pick on him. I think something that really hurt him is that you said he came out early. He hasn't seen a ton of, he hasn't seen a ton of football. And the football that he has seen is Mac football. So and, he's, he, and he's been everywhere. I've seen him everywhere on draft uh for draft previews anywhere from like mid mid round to he should have stayed next year. Mm-hmm. And he obviously came out early because he's losing the best receiver. 
It's, it's probably That's one of his was, another undrafted yep. player, yeah. and Anthony Johnson, <clears throat> so which is Tampa also Bay. surprising. I, I talked to my buddy Eric, who is <clears throat> a, he was all excited about the Tyree Jackson signing, and he said he could be the backup next year because he plays like Josh Allen. And I said it all. It's a feel good story. I said I don't think he's NFL ready. I think he's going to be a practice squad guy and. I don't know. I think he's going to be Drew Haddad or, you know, the guy that everyone wants. Uh, who's Brennan Riley now? The practice squad guy that everyone wants. I think that's going to be his ceiling. And obviously, I have, no, I have nothing against this guy. I'm not grinding an axe. I just think it's a feel-good story that ultimately there's a reason he didn't get drafted by 32 teams seven times. And I don't know what that is. I'm not in the war rooms. I'm not an expert. But I just don't see it panning out that he's going to have an NFL career. And you can hate me and call me Scrooge. I just, I wasn't all that excited. I'm like, oh, that's cool. But I don't have any expectations for Tyree Jackson. On the same token, I think that there's quarterbacks who are taken in that draft who have a lower ceiling than he does by a long shot. Baltimore's taking Trace McSorley in the sixth round. That guy's a glorified wide receiver. I mean, there's a lot of quarterbacks who just, I think they, I think as Mike mentioned, I think a lot of these guys get typecast. They look at, and that's why Russell Wilson was a third-round pick. He's short. He can't play quarterback. He can't see over his line. Mm-hmm. A lot of these guys, I'm not saying he will or won't. I just wouldn't be shocked if come start of the season, he's number two or number three on the depth chart. He's what you want in a quarterback. He's six foot seven, six foot eight. Uh, I don't know how, how heavy it is, but he's going to see over the line. He's got a cannon for an arm. He's not super accurate. But, uh, his awareness drove me nuts sometimes. I remember a play, and I know it was his first year playing, but the UB was at like the five yard line, and they had a like a third and three from the five, and he rolls out to the right, and he has the first down, and he's headed out of bounds, and instead of taking the first down, he stretches out the ball for the goal line, fumbles, it goes through the end zone for a touchback, and it was one of those things where like any amount of situational awareness whatsoever says I have the first down, live another day. Step out of bounds. First and goal from the two or three. Correct. And that that's the type of stuff that I saw from him that makes me want to stick a fork in my eye because that's the, those are drive killers and like that's on no one but him. And I know what he was trying to do, but you know, there's times that you have to be situationally aware, especially at the quarterback position. Yeah, physically he's there. He's got a rocket arm. He's a big boy, but life comes at you fast in the NFL and you better have the awareness to know what to do in what situation. As long as they don't rush him like they rushed the last couple project quarterbacks, like Cardell Jones, I think he has a chance to learn. It'll be interesting to see. I hope he succeeds. And feel good, feel good stories are what they are, but a lot of our of it. I mean, how long is Derek Anderson going to hang around here and keep playing? They had to drag him off a golf course to come here last year. Fine, but they can find someone else that's been an NFL quarterback. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm just over all these retread quarterbacks. Like, how many looks does a guy like Derek Anderson get Matt to be a Barkley played great last well, was, year I'm not, there's, there's a reason I'm not, mock, not knocking that guy specifically <laughs> he had one great game against the Jets who drafted third good for him he, he also never really got a shake in the NFL did he like he never really had a he, never, he, he played like six or seven games or something right he, I don't know doesn't matter the Sills pick I like a lot or Sills pickup I like a lot because I was hoping one of those last couple rounds they were going to take a receiver because I still don't think that receiver room is fully flushed out there's a lot of receivers right now. In How that much room, depends though. on Duke Williams here? Because if that dude lot. is good, then they are really good. How much depends on Duke Williams and um, Zay Jones? Yeah, yeah I mean, Z- Zay Jones and uh, Foster have to be happy that the Bills didn't draft all these wide receivers mm-hmm. because they would have been on the outs. Not Cole Beasley, not John Brown. If the Bills pick up three wide receivers, and you know, they're not looking to replace Cole Beasley and right. John Brown. They're I, looking to replace Zay Jones and Robert Foster. I think Zay Jones is more on the outs than, than, than Foster, though. That's 100% true yeah, as true. of right now, yes, I believe. So Zay's got some work to do. There's a lot of receivers in that room. And I I, I don't think Duke's a lock, but he's got to work. But um, it's going to be interesting. And I hope David Sills makes it. And I think I think if it comes down to like a couple players, you got to take this guy over who had a better preseason. Because his, his potential is... He just started playing receiver two years ago. And you think he had the most touchdowns in the nation in the past two seasons, I think? He was he and Will Greer had something special at West Virginia, and I think their draft stock fell off a little bit as West Virginia, the team, fell off a little bit. But it's, yeah, I don't it's know crazy anything about this guy, Grill, Jeff. Tell Grill, me about this guy, because I don't know. Well, Greer went at the end of the third round, and Sills goes undrafted. I mean, West Virginia had one of the more potent offenses, and there was a time where Will Greer and David Sills were the top, most talked about wide receiver quarterback combination in college football, and it's crazy to me that Again, you look at some of the guys who got drafted. I mean, there's 
un- we're talking about unproven Mac wide receivers all over the place and these guys who don't get looks and I think Sills has all the potential in the world. It's like Justin mentioned, he's a guy who's still kind of coming around and learning a little bit about the sport. But if he can sit behind some guys and learn how to play, my goodness so gracious, Lane he has K- some good hands. Lane Kiffin offered him a scholarship to USC when he was 13 years old as a quarterback. Damn. Yeah, he decommitted when Lane went to FAU and signed with West Virginia. So he played two years at receiver, 15.9 yards per catch, 35 touchdowns in two years as a brand new guy in his position. It's like, pretty good. So he was, I guess I saw my, I saw my buddy who was a big a West Virginia fan. He said he was leading the, he was leading the nation in touchdowns last year. He had 18 touchdown catches last and year. And then his quarterback or him got hurt. I think the quarterback got hurt. And that's when he dropped his production fell off last year. But that, I'm excited about this guy. And there's one guy I'm excited about the pick this draft is probably this guy. And at Oliver, but he was first team All Big Twelve, second team College Football All America, and third team All America from the AP. So in terms of guys who didn't get drafted, I know how many of those numbers don't. Earn, but he had thirty three touchdowns receiving the last couple of years. The, the only knock on Dawson Knox is he can't get in the end zone. This guy gets in the end zone every chance he gets. <laughs> so it's, it's over a touchdown. It's almost, it's two touchdowns a game almost. One hundred thirty two receptions, two thousand ninety seven yards, sixteen yards per catch. 35 TDs in what, two what, seasons. What was this 40 time? Do we know? I'm sure we could find it. Because when you think about it. a guy like this, usually like the late round guys that, like my guess is he's probably a burner, but maybe he just doesn't have much else out there. What are you, 457? 457. So He's got a pretty quick uh, cone drill in 20 years. Who's that, DK Metcalf? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> not, not Metcalf. Sorry. He's the reverse DK womp, Metcalf. Womp. He had a slower 40, but a great... A great shuttle and a great cone drill. Um, the 40 is overrated. Yeah, 100%. Unless you're the fastest guy, unless you're literally John Ross yep. or Chris Johnson, I don't care. Yep. yep. Because in, unless you can make a guy miss in the open field, unless you can cut that route correctly, pure speed as a wide receiver, incredibly overrated. Mm-hmm. I said it. I mean, how many guys is the only guy that John Ross ever left in his wake was the guy who was guarding him for the Bills last year. It's the only guy that John Ross has ever beat on an NFL football field. It was field. probably <laughs> Stefan Gilmore because that guy sucks. I'm just kidding. I love Stefan Gilmore. But anyways, I'm just glad that his family can watch him play in the NFL these days. Mm-hmm. Good for him. Yeah. Lucky guy. If he, if he was on the Browns, he'd probably get more primetime, honestly, at this point. The Browns have a ton of primetime games this year. I you guys saw They're going to win four They're games. They're all over the place. They're going to win four games. Now, four and man. 12. I don't know. I told yeah, they look I exciting. To, I was talking to a friend. This could be a year that the Browns and the Bills make the playoffs. What's the Browns win <laughs> total cow. in Vegas? When has that happened? Ten and a half, I think. Is it? I, that sounds right because I've heard this, but it just still feels like they're going to be the Browns. I think the Bills have improved their offensive line enough. I think that was their real issue last year. The rookie quarterback, and Allen was 5-5 five and five in games that he finished, but... He had to grind those out because the O-line stunk. Ooh. The O-line is part of it. I'm sorry, Steve. You want to mm-hmm. finish that last No, line. you're good. The Browns are at nine. Are we betting this? We should just pool our money, all of it, and bet the over Man, on I the want Browns. The, I want the over on Browns winning nine games. See, this is mm. Caesars. This is on Bleacher Report. Caesars has them at nine games. What does it have the Bills at? I'll take the under and the Browns. Seven. Think, I think the I, I was joking, but I th- don't think they're going to be as good as everyone thinks. But I, th- I blame it on, on an overzealous copy of Baker Mayfield. You are close with the seven. The Bills are at six and a half. Do you take the over? On, I feel more confident taking the over on that, I think, than... I want both The Bills overs. don't have a strong schedule this year. Yeah, I, th- I take the over on the Bills. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, the big think, knock of the Bills is Josh Allen. Yeah. Uh, that, <laughs> so let, let's do two quick things here. Um, firstly, I think that, going just finishing the Browns' point, the AFC North is falling apart. The Bengals are terrible. The Steelers are jettisoning talent at this point. Ben Roethlisberger is 38 or whatever They just is. extended him. Yeah, I think they're going to have a terrible year, and it's Cleveland's division to lose with Baltimore in second. Mm-hmm. Other point entirely. What do you guys think is going to be the biggest make-or-break area for the Bills this team? The Bills team this year. What will decide whether they're a six-win team or a nine-win team knocking on a wild card or even better than that? What is going to be the area that if they don't succeed in or don't improve in, the season is a loss? Uh, the biggest area is going to be, I think, utilizing their talent. Depends on how they use the new guys they got. I just, um, just, I, just, just acquiescing all those players into the fold and mm-hmm. getting the Ed Oliver 
bump to the f- defensive line kind of I, stuff. I think it, I think it falls on the offense. The defense is not an issue. The defense has improved. You're gonna have a uh, uh, Tremaine, Tremaine, Tremaine Edwards with a whole season under his belt. Mm-hmm. Got the whole secondary back um, with EJ Gaines this time. With EJ again. Gaines, what was what was the bill of record with EJ Gaines? Eight and three. Eight and three. Um, Damn. I I I I don't not worry about the defense. I think the offense has improved enough to where they can get points. Not a lot of points, but enough points. For the defense to, to get them win. I'm going to go the opposite route. Not just We did not plan this to be parity. I think the offense is going to be okay. I think that they were okay last year. Like They, they played okay. Was, I think what's going to hurt, make or break them is if they can stop the run and pass rush of that defensive line. Because you think about the, the bad games that they had last year were when running backs were going for 250 yards. And it was just goofy out there because they were unable to stop anything when it came to the run. Now, they got better and they, were, they did much better. But I think if they are... Like if you're gonna beat New England, you gotta get to Brady. And if they can do that, I think like you look at the Monday night game. They they were better than New England for most of that game. They were um, better than New England for almost all of that game. They and, just couldn't and, score. Right. If they had Anil, and I think they had to beat him. But I uh, I'm looking at the offense thinking it's going to be okay. They might only score twenty, twenty five points a game, but if their defense can do what they're building it to do and get to the quarterback and stop I think they're gonna be a stifling defense. If the defensive line guys like Trent Murphy gotta show up. Ed Oliver's got to show up. Stars got to keep eating double teams. They, they need Jerry Hughes to have a big year. I just keep looking at that front four. If that if that front four, Shaq Lawson, if they get the pre- the pressure that I think they can, I think it's going to be a really fun year to watch this defense because I think those boys are going to eat. See, the funny thing is, you talked about the they needed to be able to, the games that they defense played the worst in when they're giving up a whole bunch of yards rushing, and I think that the Bills. Rushing offense is their make or break this year because I think they need to take part of the game off of Josh Allen. I mean, I didn't feel comfortable with him being one carrying the ball a lot of the time. I think they need to get the ball. He needs to get the ball into his talent's hands, whether it's a running back, receiver. But I think part of doing that is being having a reliable running game to bring the defense up and allowing Allen to go over the top of the defense. I was going to say, before I say, the Bills have any semblance of a running game, any semblance, they're automatically better this year. And if I can build off what you two guys said, my answer was going to be, it's the passing game. It is, more than ever, it's a passing league. And everything is so connected on the offense. Improving the offensive line helps the passing game. Having a run game that impacts the game and takes pressure off Josh Allen positively impacts the passing game. But at the end of the day, the Super Bowl being the biggest outlier, the NFL at its highest level is a passing league. Think about the five best football games that you watched last year that the Bills weren't in, and think about how many yards passing. How many? Think about the Super Bowl two years ago when Foles and Brady went off for a thousand yards. Yeah, just the 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 Chiefs, the Rams, the Patriots. Those teams at this at the stage last year, at least, are the pinnacle of success in the NFL, and they all do it by just gunning it deep, aiming for fifty points a game. The defense is great, and defense can win you games. It won the Patriots the Super Bowl because they had a good defense, and they game planned very well for the Rams. But you have to be able to go swinging with those teams. And it's great to have the team that wants to run the ball the most, and if you're good at it, it's great, and you can make the playoffs like that. I still don't believe that you can win a Super Bowl if you are a run-first offense in the NFL because someone else has a bigger gun, and they're going to score more points than you. I think with this new O line and the receivers they got, they didn't bring in superstars per se, but they got two quality veterans that can, can get open, which they didn't have last year. Guys, can, 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 could, they couldn't get open, and also they didn't have the time to get open. Um, I, I always kind of dog on Josh Allen. I don't. He's got a cannon. We all know that. He's kind of inaccurate, but I think, and I don't worry about him. Like I don't think. Like, I don't worry about them like I worry about like JP Lossman and AJ Manuel. Like they just they just just baller and grinds it out. I love to watch them play. Um, if you can figure out the position, reading blitzes and defenses and get his mechanics down. And I think he had the mechanics down, but then the O line had him running for his life kind of took it back to square one. Um I think this team right now is set up for Allen's do damage. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm actually looking forward to it. I think the Bills can be a playoff team this year. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, there's no reason they can't be, I don't think. The strength of schedule, 
I'm not afraid of Darnold or He's, Rosen. Let's be clear. Allen's got to know that this year it's not going to be just him as the offense. Yep. The offense yeah. was just him. Can we talk about that for a and, second? And how by does the way? he feel about this? The, the moves that have been made. They're making moves to protect him, and they're getting him weapons. He's got to feel pretty yeah. damn good. Oh, but absolutely. Anyway, so you're right. Let's talk about Darnold and Rosen. Yeah, that's um. So the other thing that happens from the draft, other than Kyler Murray going to Arizona, well, it's tangent to that. Kyler Murray goes number one to Arizona. You wondered if they were going to do it. They do it. And that puts them in a corner where now you've drafted a quarterback number one overall back to back years and they've clearly given up on Rosen as the future. So they trade Rosen to Miami. Now Miami was and maybe still is for all intents and purposes, basically throwing the year away. They were ready they to had start Ryan Fitzpatrick. Fitzpatrick. That doesn't throw the year away, Jeff. He was great with Tampa Bay. He last would be year. seven and nine, seven games where he throws for four hundred and five <laughs> touches and nine games where he goes for two hundred and one and three. <laughs> it's it's how it is with him. He's John Clayton Jekyll always, and Hyde. John incredible. Clayton always said Ryan Fitzpatrick will be the reason you win five games a year, and it'll be the reason you lose ten. And and like the more you watch, and the more true it is. And he's probably just the best available backup quarterback any team could want. But if you're starting him, you're and Tampa saw it too when they tried to start him over Jameis when Jameis was back from the suspension. Like the the Cinderella story ends real quick when you got to rely on him for sixteen games. I mean, the Dolphins were being looked at as the worst. Maybe in my opinion, I thought going into this, they were the worst team that was going to be in the AFC this year. I mean, the Jets were making some good moves. The Dolphins in a division with a Buffalo team and a Jets team making good moves. And the Patriots were a three to four win team. Maybe they still are even with Rosen. But now it's interesting. You got three quarterbacks who were taken in the top 10 last year, all now in the same division. And this could be if all of them develop and all of them become the stars their teams hope it could be. The AFC East got really interesting when Miami added Josh Rosen. Got really fun. Yeah, I mean, this is 10 to 15 years of... <laughs> but when you really think about it, Josh Rosen got traded in the exact same spot. He got traded. He got drafted into an Arizona. There's not an O-line. He doesn't have any good receivers to throw to. Uh, I don't think he's going to have any more success in Miami than he did in Arizona. And who does Darnold have? Robbie Anderson? I mean, yeah. I'm Le'Veon Bell. I don't think Bell's going to be nearly as good as he was in Pittsburgh. whole year off. I think that the line, we go back to the offensive line. They had a I great line, that, yeah. Because uh-huh. what's Bell's claim to fame? He gets the ball, he waits, waits, the hole opens, and he goes through it. What happens in New York when he gets the ball, waits, waits, and gets swallowed up because there ain't no hole coming? I don't know. I think the Jets are better than people give them credit for. I don't they think they're good. they got a good, good. defense. Well, they have a great defense. They've got a strong defense. Those are going to clean them up week one. I just I just think Josh Wilson kind of just went, just jumped into the same pool he was already in. Like I don't think <laughs> I I still think he'd be the best quarterback in this draft. I still think he has all the tools. In my opinion, I think he's the best passer. Uh, but um, I just <laughs> I mean the, I the biggest step up for him is having a organization that wants him there. And it's been clear for a while that Arizona did not want him to be the guy. Did they not want him to be the guy? That they 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 got the first the, they, first, the number one picks coach. And he's there, like, but he, that wasn't his coach. It was a guy. It was a guy who played against him. He coached Texas uh, Texas uh, Tech, and he played against him in Oklahoma. My bad. I mean, he just Kingsbury wants to play that style with Kyler Murray and the running gun mobile quarterback. But Kyler Murray's you, not even a football player. He plays baseball. He's gonna have to slide a lot because no one's gonna fucking block for him in Arizona. <laughs> let me tell you that. You know what? He's pretty democratic in the red state. <laughs> Let's just put it on that. Miami can go both. Florida goes both ways, though. So we'll see. Half the audience is going to love him. Half of them is going to hate him. That's that's. I did see that a lot from people. It was like you know they, they love the player, they they love the athlete, but they hate the player. And then he goes out and posts like a really nice Instagram message, like I just want to thank the Cardinals for drafting me and giving me the chances, and I'm really excited to be a Miami Dolphin. Heaven forbid this guy have an opinion and is just like some football playing robot who is going to get his 80th concussion and spout off some racist shit on Twitter or whatever. <laughs> I'm excited to watch him. I'm excited. When he actually happy with the Dolphins. I hope it doesn't turn out to be great now because we got to do them twice a year. Um, but I, d- I was <laughs> really hoping I was I'm just really hoping he Ryan wasn't going to go to the Dolphins because I wanted to cheer for him. Yeah. And I can't cheer for him in Miami. Part genuinely, of, listen. Part of me, I was texting Steve about it during the draft. Said so part of me really wanted to see him go to the Patriots just to watch the fucking world burn. What was my answer? I just, you said <laughs> you wanted them to get Rosen and draft Metcalf. Yeah, and be good for another fifteen years. I just, and I was like, <laughs> "Fuck you." <laughs> Some fatalist shit over there. I love, I, I love carnage. I love, I wanted to see the world just burn, and then I was texting Steve <laughs> about it. <laughs> it would have been funny to me. Did you feel vindicated um, about your Metcalf opinion when he slid all the way to the last pick of the second round? I felt very vindicated. 
because there were a lot of receivers who had second and third round grades who were taken way ahead of that guy. Well, I was excited about him, the prospect of him originally, until I had the conversation with you about him, and I took a step back and actually thought what you said and watched tape on him and read about him. I was like, oh, Jeff's right. No, no, Seattle's first. Bad. That's the let, let's clip clip that. Everybody clip that. That's the first and last time we're ever going to have that discussion. On so this now podcast. they have Metcalf instead of Doug Baldwin, right? Doug Baldwin say, saying that he might not play anymore. Yep. So yeah. now it's all about DK Metcalf in Seattle. Man, imagine Why being DK imagine line? being Russell Wilson. Imagine you have no offensive line. You have a running back carousel. Your number one receiver gets hurt, and you're throwing to a guy who can't run a curl route. Imagine <laughs> drafting a fantasy team last year no, and picking Le'Veon Bell in the first round and like Doug Baldwin in like the third <laughs> round, and it's a dynasty league. You hate to see it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, my friend, they'll listen to this, and yeah, you gotta anyways. give you gotta give Wilson credit because he never really has great running backs. He never really has. He was, was their leading rusher last year. Yeah, never has great. <laughs> he he deserves every dollar. Back. He never 100%. has great receivers to throw to. If if there is a single quarterback in the NFL who deserves that pay raise, Russell Wilson. If Russell Wilson tore his ACL, the Seahawks would win two games. There is not. He is the offense. He's, He's the baller. entirety of it. It's baller. incredible. And we'll see how he does this year. Losing the if Baldwin can't play, that is a huge blow to that. The, basket, the end but. of his stat line after every game is literally a college football game, like when Denard Robertson played in Michigan. Yeah, yeah, he's twenty three of twenty seven for two hundred twenty yards and two touchdowns. Also, twenty one rushing attempts <laughs> for ninety seven yards and a touchdown. He like, caught a pass somehow, <laughs> blocked a kick. He's all over the place. Returned an interception. Yeah, right. Playing both sides of the ball, playing safety. So I'm excited for football. It's the post draft is the worst part of the offseason for me because all I want to do play. is watch Ed Oliver play preseason football right now and have to wait, and it sucks. I just want to watch these guys play especially, football, especially since there's about three months or so until yeah, there's anything. Real then, rough. They, then they tease you with the mini cams for the rookies a little bit. Yeah, it's it's rough. This is the yeah, this is the worst part of the football year, I guess. Ed Oliver is also the most excited I've been for a Bills first round pick in a while. Yeah. I wasn't this excited about Josh Allen. We talked about that pretty openly on the show last year. None of I us were. wasn't excited about Trey White, not necessarily because I didn't care. I just didn't think he was the player that he is. I wasn't excited about Sam because they traded up for a wide receiver. So I'm ex- I'm genuinely excited to watch Ed Oliver play in a Bills this jersey. This is the first time in a long time that I've been genuinely excited about the Bills. I just like I do it because I live here and I gotta follow. I do this show. I watch the games. I but I I haven't been ex- I haven't been excited in a while because they stink, and it's the same thing over and over. And I but this year I'm excited. This year I lo- I really love what McDermott and Bean are doing over there. Have they ever had a year where they signed this many free agents? No, I'm not. Like, like, I don't good? know what the actual no. stats are, but they've signed like eighteen free agents. Like, I think I think the big the big turning point for free agents coming here now. Is Bills Mafia? It's the fans, because the the fans here is crazy. I think people are coming here for the atmosphere. It's just like it's around the league. Everyone knows about it. Everyone knows about it. I, it doesn't hurt. I think it's, it's the first thing here. Sorry, it's the first thing I don't want to talk about that comes here. Is Bills Mafia? Well, well, and now the facility too. As stupid well, as that is, there it's also. brand new though. <laughs> Not. I don't want to rain on that parade because I don't think you're entirely incorrect. I do think that the fans play a role in that. I do also think that the statement that gets published on the Bills social media where they talk about the fans is published for a reason. And they don't just they weren't not gonna publish like I found a really nice condo in Amherst and you know the education for my kids in the area is really good. They wanna pump up the fans about it. Of course they're gonna say they wanna play in front of these fans. They want people to like them here. Yeah, but you see you hear from the players directly, not even from the Bills in their articles. I know, but the first thing they tweet out they when they tweet, get drafted yeah. is Bill's Mafia. Like, mm-hmm. I know, but if, you, if you're trying for Carolina, the first thing you tweet out is keep pounding. You tweet whatever your team hashtag is. Mm-hmm. I'm always pounded. Well, that's that's what <laughs> Justin tweets that on his personal Twitter at least once a week. He's not a Panthers fan at all. It's unrelated. Got pounded. Not the same thing, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with Switching that. gears. <laughs> so, anything else that you guys want to talk about on the draft? At all. Bills or not, because there was a lot that went on that first day. 
It the looked, Patriots, it looked pretty lit the Patriots are always great at drafting. If they don't move up, look at these geniuses. They didn't trade up. They know how to use their draft capital. They trade up. Look at these geniuses. They traded up, and the Patriots, they've earned that. They absolutely have earned that. I also really love Nikhil Harry, and I'm scared mm. about it. But whatever, the best whatever. All, they was, the draft. all they did was Josh Rosen. They'd be set, man. Oh, my gosh. I think Nikhil Harry was the best receiver on the draft. Don't worry, you, Tom you Brady's going to be around year. for another four years, five years. So <laughs> He's going to George Bland it. <laughs> Can't wait till he kicks an extra point. Like, go for the drop Doug kick, kick like Flutie did. Yeah, <laughs> I've never seen Belichick smile more than when Flutie made that kick. He was actually more excited about that than a Super Bowl. I think he just wanted to use that obscure scoring rule. He mm-hmm. was waiting for an opportunity and the right guy to do it. Yeah, you know, at three thirty in the morning one day, he was like eating some Cheetos and read that rule and was like, I'm "Fucking doing <laughs> just it. doing his weekly reading." And the NFL oh, rulebook is like, "Yeah, we're doing he's, this." He's just now trying to figure out when he can use the fair catch kick and benefit off that. It's gonna happen. It's 100% going to happen. If that happens this season, you're going to look like a savant, by the way. He does that this season now after this. Um, Steve did want to talk about it. I also am all on board for talking about it. It's been a little bit since uh, we talked. Man, how fun are these NHL playoffs this year? I know the Sabres aren't involved, so we, we're we bearing it on the back end of the show. But just as a fan of the sport of hockey, what a set of playoffs these have been from a neutral standpoint. I've been glued to the television. So I... Um, hit the shower and I, you know, way too much information, but I'm listening to the game while I'm in the shower and I hear Ray Ferraro, who I don't hate. I don't love his voice, but he literally says the Golden Knights are up to nothing here. And if they get the third one, it's going to be curtains here for the Sharks. Well, <laughs> sure enough, they get it. They get the third one. And that was far from curtains, Razor, because so I get out of the shower and I, I have the game on my iPad. I have the Spectrum app so I can watch TV right on my iPad. And I'm walking around, and I put the iPad down in the kitchen to start making coffee for the morning. It's like 11.30, 11.15. Like, I'm winding those down Those West for the Coast night. games, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm grinding up the coffee beans because we make coffee the right way in our house. And I'm feeding the cat because the cat gets fed before bed. And then the five-minute power play comes. And I'm like, all right. So I'm standing in the kitchen watching the game on my iPad because they're not going to fucking score three times. But like, they scored. I'm like, hmm. Then they scored again. Now the iPad gets turned off. The living room light gets turned on. <laughs> and I'm Came up it watching it on the 60-inch yeah. flat screen in my living room. And that was worth every minute of lost sleep that night because I ended up being up another 90 minutes. Oh, yeah, all the game done. went to overtime and every yeah. full intermission and yeah, playoffs that, and everything. Yeah. That was unbelievable. I was glued to the TV. I was planning on going to sleep. Nothing to see here. Three nothing nights. And, man, that was epic. Let's talk about that real quick. Bad call. Terrible. Okay. But don't fucking allow four goals in a power play. Yeah, it was it was Facts. A, it was a, it <laughs> yeah. was it was a two minute cross check. <laughs> yep. Two the it's Knights, only... Knights well, yeah, it's two minute penalty probably yeah. for sure. Mm-hmm. The five minute they, they gave a five because it the looked dude's awful. brain was coming out of yeah. the hole in his helmet. Yeah. They <laughs> they penalize you in an injury, not the not yeah, the play. So the way I look at it is it's a three nothing game and it's it's over. Ever I think we would all agree at that point, like Golden Knights stranglehold game is over. Guy gets severely injured and if you're the referee, we talk about them not doing this in playoffs. I think they wanted just to keep the game under control. If you don't penalize anyone in that in Eakin or Statsy in that situation, the first San Jose guy comes out, he runs the first goal in 90 C's. You just didn't want the game to get out of control. It was a two-minute penalty. I think they gave it five minutes trying to keep the game in their grasp, and you're 100% right. You, it's the second time ever it's happened. You cannot allow them to score three or four goals on a major. You just can't do it. You, they lost that game. They can say whatever they want. Marcheseau can say whatever yep. he wanted, and he's not entirely wrong. But you can't absolve yourself of the sin of allowing four goals on right. a five-minute power You can't power control point. the call. What you can't control is the penalty kill. Two, Marcheseau going off. Vegas, they, they mentioned they lost the series because of that call. They were gifted a game. Earlier, earlier, yeah, earlier. game two was the reverse yep. of that. Yeah. So, piss off. Here's the other Number, part. No, and ahead, sorry, also, sorry. fuck the league for apologizing to the Knights for that. Yep. That is the stupidest thing. Just own it, let it go. NFL wouldn't have done that. Nope. Like if if you don't apologize, it's, it's way better off not, not now. Now the Sharks want an apology for the apology. The Knights. <laughs> yeah. Did you see that earlier. Here, here's the other thing. Who went off? Who was who was ejected from the game? Cody Aiken. Who is? Hmm. What what what's his primary role with the Vegas Golden Knights? Penalty killer. Penalty killer. Hmm. He's on their top penalty kill. So not only is Cody Eakin wrongfully given a five minute penalty and removed from the game. He is their top. He is on their top penalty kill, and that but that's hurts. still not a that's still not a four goal no, swing. It, sure, it just ends up being very interesting. Like if they would have given it to Stastny instead. The worst like, part of this whole thing is the apology. 
It's sure. stupidest thing. Don't apologize for that. And how about LeBanc? You know LeBanc had points on all four of those goals. He's re- unbelievable that you would get four points like that. If we lived in the Mountain or Pacific time zone, we we would talk about Kevin LeBanc as a guy mm-hmm. we wanted to be here. Mm-hmm. Kevin LeBanc is incredible. And they're not the big market teams. They're not the high like the high attention seeking teams that left at this point of the playoffs, except for maybe Boston. But all of these teams are here for a reason. And mm-hmm. that second to third line death of all these teams, the Hurricanes are another great example. The Sharks are a great example. Colorado finally, maybe this year for once in the last ten years, as a bit of an example. Kevin LeBanc talk, that's the, that's a career defining five minutes for him on that power play. That guy's gonna his next payday is gonna be huge because everyone's gonna think about this guy can play like that in the playoffs for me. Oh, fun playoffs though. Back to that. Everyone hates this playoff series, this format. I mean, I love it because it, it creates these excellent matchups, these rivalries. It stinks for the players because you you play you want to play for seeding. You're the first team you want to put the worst team in the playoffs. You know, but I I do agree with that. But I love the format for the matchups it creates. The first round is always the past since they started. The first round's been amazing to watch every year since they started this. I'm wondering if the format change actually impacts it that much. If they could do any format and get some good matchups at some point organically. I'm I'm very happy with how it played out this year. Yeah. I just I don't know, maybe next year it's the same format and it sucks, or they change the format and it's great. I just think this year was the perfect storm of there were wild card teams that came in hot and hungry. A couple of those division winners came in not playing great. Fat and lazy. Yeah, I mean, and it's it, I I know I I understand what they did. I actually I had no problem with the one versus eight, you know, seating format. Uh, but it's those those aren't usually fun games to watch though. You know, it's just, these games now are super interesting. They're all very fun to watch. What who are the teams you guys are rooting through? Who are the teams that you want out tomorrow? So there's eight teams left. Yeah. Who are the teams that you're rooting for? Who are the teams that you want out? I'm all in on Columbus right now. Mm-hmm. I'm loving Columbus. And I got to go St. Louis. You want St. Louis out? Oh. No, that's who you're rooting for. So you're he, rooting he, for he wants a Columbus St. Louis champion. Okay, yeah. that's yeah. fine. Yeah. And what teams do you want out? Boston. P- yeah. Preach. It. Carolina. Get the fuck. I just, I just hate Boston. I, the other seven teams, I'm 100% okay with. Just yep. hate Boston. I'm with you. I'm all in on the. I want Joe Thornton to win a cup mm-hmm. in his last year in San Jose bandwagon. I would be I'm all saying. in for San Jose and then. Whoever in the East that's not Boston, I don't care. I just want to see a video of a shirtless Joe Thornton just getting beer dumped all over his his his, his face. It actually out, wouldn't out of drip cup. off of him; it would no, just all soak into his beard. I'm you trying wouldn't... to I'm trying to set the image here, and you're fucking ruining it, Steve. <laughs> Sorry. I want Joe Thornton holding a cup above his head, just pouring beer on his face, and just leaking down through his beard all over his shirtless body. Hmm. You on. must have checked out that body issue <laughs> that he did. He's got just, taped to the wall next to his big. I just remember a picture of your offseason of like a him and Brent Burns yep. just wearing no shirt and jeans. It's like that's a, body that's a issue. great picture. <laughs> I do not want Boston because I cannot stand Brad Marchand, and I'm just tired of Boston fans winning everything. I also want Dallas gone. Just go. I don't like you. Just go away. I like Tyler Sagan. I I just feel like they shouldn't even be in the playoffs, and here they are. They're, I mean, they won a series. They beat Nashville to do it. Like I'm not. I just want them, and it's nothing to do with 1999. I just feel like they don't belong. They're not a good team. They're talking about their goaltending and how good it is. Bishop has not been awesome. I don't, bye. Go away. I don't know. I have a. I don't want Boston. I don't want Dallas. And I'm rooting for probably Western teams, San Jose. Wouldn't mind St. Louis because I like Bennington and O'Reilly. Colorado would be awesome. But San Jose is probably my top because of Joe Thornton. I'm with you on that one, Jeff. When you said it, that resonated with me. I mean, between him, I Evander was kind of a, a lightning rod while he was here, but I don't hate him. I like Carlson after everything he went through, trying to win a cup out there. Couture is a Bills fan, tweeting about it all the time. He, that team kind of resonates with me as a Buffalo sports fan. My there's no, there's no hatred towards them. There's yeah. no history. There's no hatred. We got Dallas, you know, wanting Dallas out of the playoffs. See Joan Javad's tweet. Over the weekend, <laughs> trying to win their first legitimate cup or whatever. Yeah, the Dallas Stars are eleven wins away from their first legi- legitimate Stanley Cup in NHL history. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> and he it's works true, in Texas. <laughs> he knows what's up. Yeah, you can leave Buffalo, but Buffalo never fully leaves you. Former friend of the pod, Jonah Javad. Is there anything else, guys? As we wrap up our hockey segment for the night, anything else we wanted to, to tack on to 
I think FC Buffalo is a friendly Friday, right? I was right? going to say, FC Buffalo is friendly this Friday at All High. So go out to that. All High is fun. It's fun to watch soccer there. Mm-hmm. Or football, depending on which version of that you prefer it to be called. The situation Room is fun. It is loud. Matches are quality. Just go out and support the boys. It's cheap. It's get, get your FC Buffalo tickets for Friday. Get your Bandits tickets for Saturday. It's a great... People talk. This is not. People talk about this being a dead time for sports. It is a lively time still for sports in Buffalo. Yeah, we have the hey, best professional lacrosse fan, team in the world currently playing fan, here. The Bison's games. I don't. I don't know whether they're home or away this weekend, but they've been I, struggling. They went through. They lost like seven in a row or something I'm, with Vlad, but I don't know. I hope he. I'm waiting for his first homer with the Jays sooner than later. Hmm. I'm all about it. I don't like the Jays at all, but I hope he does well. I I always liked his dad when uh, when he was playing in Anaheim for the Angels. His dad was so fun to watch mm-hmm. back in the Expos days I, and through to the Angels. I always I always loved because I was living in California at the time when uh, he was out there. Is um, one of the uh, commentators would go, oh, "What was it from his from his nose to his toes, wherever the pitch is, Vladdy goes or yep. something yeah, like that." Yeah, basically the the way the guy would sw- like he would golf the ball or I was go. Say, I, I'm convinced at that, it. I'm convinced there could be a curveball in the dirt that he could hit for a home run. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm convinced he probably at some point in his career hit a pitch that bounced in front of the oh, plate and a, golfed yeah, it. Yep. And it's I know no guys. one gives a rip in this room, but the Yankees, the Double A squad, New York Yankees, are still winning every game with ninety million dollars on the injured list. It feels pretty good to be a Yankees fan because they literally have ninety million dollars on the injured list and they keep winning. What's What's it going to be like if they get all those guys back and they become terrible then? But they won't. I, I don't know. <laughs> they, weren't. they were bad when the season started. They weren't healthy when the season started either, though. They, yeah, they, they were more healthy. Mm, I don't know. I think that they, uh, I don't know. It's fun It's fun to be a Yankees fan. It's devastating because the guys that are playing as replacements are getting injured. But um, yeah. anyways. I'm just over here enjoying the last season of Francisco Lindor before the Indians refuse to pay him and he becomes a multi-billionaire somewhere on the West Coast. It's a really sad <laughs> What's feeling. going on with Jose Ramirez? He'll figure it out. He'll figure it out. Okay. Wasn't sure. I'm not worried Because then Carnacion's playing well. Yeah. With Seattle, but he can't. He can't be an everyday third baseman at this point. I don't think. Hmm. Jeff and I should probably just keep talking about baseball after the podcast. Jay Ramos, yeah. just fine. Because Justin's end. rolling his don't eyes we, at us. He end. actually stopped recording four <laughs> minutes end ago. While you're talking, <laughs> <laughs> he's falling asleep in hey, his chair. Hey, Steve, don't you got something to your left that we're supposed to uh, review? Oh shit! Yeah, yeah, guys, you <laughs> thought the show was over because we were talking baseball. Steve brought a candy bar. You thought Mike was going to forget about that? <laughs> <laughs> Mike hey, taught food. That boy's getting hungry. So, Steve, while you're, uh... Jesus, fuck. <laughs> that, is, that did not want to be split. <laughs> is it? What is this? This is called a Milky Way fudge. So the nougat inside, as opposed to being the regular nougat, is chocolate. This is going to be amazing, then. <laughs> That's what I said before we started recording. I'm all in on this. Yeah, that's pretty good. Much better than that shit I brought last time. <laughs> so, yeah, so don't I'll, I'll try to talk. We got caramel in our mouth here. They're great. Excellent. Audio medium. Yeah, that's pretty fantastic. Let's ever do this is keep the mics away from our mouths when we're eating. It's no, this is awful. 100% on purpose. I want people to hear my tonsils. <laughs> 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 all right. Good candy bar. This is a this is a bad one to review because we knew it was going to be good by reading it. Well, I never had it before, so it's Me fair. Neither. That's why I'm bringing. But it is good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So while we're all digesting, thank you all for listening here to another edition of the Seven Six Sports Podcast. We will be back here with you probably next Monday. That seems likely. Mm-hmm. Maybe we'll the playoff. Have we'll have some playoff games to talk about. Yeah. Now maybe, that the, maybe uh, the Sabres will have a coach by then. Now that the U eighteen juniors are over or championships are over, uh, Gromberg is not coaching. Maybe that interview will take place. If they hired, if they I hired Jack Martin, I thought he's coaching until like shit. March, May twenty sixth or something. I don't know what I'm talking about. I haven't followed it. Yeah, in like weeks because now. they asked him if he Gronberg if he was interested. He said, "Right now, I'm coaching Team Sweden until May twenty sixth. Oh, should have checked the Twitter machine this morning. I get well, busy at work because he's man. coaching Team Sweden. So, for Worlds, I believe. Right? Does that sound right? He literally just said something this morning, right, yeah. like I'm right now focused on coaching the best team in the world, Team Sweden, and that wraps up May twenty sixth. So who's still on? The, who's still possible? Is Chris Taylor, Sheldon Keefe, Jacques Martin, Jacques Martin. Don't watch Jacques Martin. Uh, what about um? Is it uh, 
Tippett? Dave Tippett? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, they're gonna hire Pierre a bad McGuire. Coach. They're gonna hire a bad coach. You think so? Yeah. Jacques Martin was coaching in the NHL before I was born. I don't. I think want the I think the longer that this waits, the more encouraged I am because I think that it's either gonna be Sheldon Keefe who's still coaching or Gronberg who's still coaching. Because I think if it was gonna be like Jacques Martin or Dave Tippett, they'd be hired by already. I don't know. I hope you're right. Me too. Because I they, do not want Jacques Martin here. They're gonna fuck this. And if, and if they were going to promote Taylor now that Rochester's done, they wouldn't. Yeah, there's have no, done that no right. need to win anymore. Right. They know. clearly at least want to talk to one of those yeah, guys. And Taylor did say he, at this point he's not focused on, you know, if, on giving attention to if he wants the NHL job yet or something. I don't know. It's all it's all coach speak. Only one man for this job. Only one man for this job. Ted Nolan. Lindy Ruff. Oh, well. <laughs> I love the fake uh, fake account that got Lindy rolling a couple weeks ago. I was yeah. like, oh, yeah, Lindy, let's bring back that guy. Nothing yeah. more savers than wanting to move forward by moving backwards. <laughs> hey, if you want nostalgia, bring back uh, 85-year-old Scotty Bowman. Oh, mm-hmm. So no, just, we'll bring back Lindy. We'll bring back Ted Nolan for a third time, and then we can finally make a smart hire when go. Jack signs with the Bruins. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be so, too late. Blues were up 2-1 last check. Dallas tied it, and now the Blues just scored again to be up 3-2 with 5.36 remaining. So there's that. All right, we're getting out of here. Yeah, yeah, we'll be back next week. Thanks all for listening. Like, share, and subscribe to the show. Find us on social media. Do whatever you want. Just listen. We love you. Bye.